today we begin our study of Aditya Samopada or dependent origination. Aditya Samopada is a very important teaching <coughs> among the teachings of the Buddha. And this teaching makes Buddhism different from all other religions. And this doctrine teaches that all mental and physical phenomena in living beings are conditioned. So everything we find in beings, <coughs> their mind and also the physical body, everything is dependent upon some other condition. So this doctrine teaches that there is nothing which is absolute, which arises uh, without any condition. <coughs> and also it teaches that since uh, these mental and physical phenomena arise through conditions, there is no such thing as creation or someone creating anything at all. First, <coughs> I want you to be familiar with the, the Pali name of this teaching, Patitya Samopada. And it is translated as dependent origination, dependent arising, or conditions arising, or conditions genesis. So there are many English translations for this one party word, Patitya Samopada. So I think it is better to use the Pali word than to use the English word because uh, there are many translations. The word Patitya Samopada was used by the Buddha to mean those physical and mental phenomena which condition other physical and mental phenomena to arise. So actually, Patitya Samupada means the conditions or the causes. There is another word, which is Patitya Samupanna, and that word means those that arise depending on conditions. So, Patitya Samubhada means the causes and Patitya Samubhada means mm. the, the results <coughs> of those that are conditioned. But in popular usage, Patitya Samubhada means arising depending upon some other thing. So according to this teaching, everything has a condition for it. To arise. There are many meanings explained in the commentaries, but I'm not going to tell you those meanings because they may be confusing to you. Just note that Patitya mm -hmm. Samubhada is used by Buddha to mean uh, things that condition other things. <coughs> this word is composed of two, two parts, Patitya and Samopata. So Patitya means depending, dependent upon, and Samopata means uh, those that arise mm, together. 
but in, in actual usage, it means not those that arise uh, out of conditions, but the conditions themselves. And this law of dependent arising <coughs> was not the creation of the Buddha. Buddha did not invent it, or Buddha did not created it, uh, create it, but the Buddha discovered this law of dependent arising and then taught it to the world. Buddha once said, whether Buddhas arise in this world or do not arise in this world, this law of dependent arising has always been there. Buddhas only discovered it and then revealed it to the world. It is like the law of gravitation. The law of gravitation was not, not created by such as like Newton. It has been with the world since the beginning of the world, but nobody uh, no, knew about it or nobody was aware about the law of gravitation. But as the story goes, one day an apple fell on the head of Sir Isaac Newton, and this falling of an apple on his head set him thinking about the gravitation. And so he discovered the law of gravitation. So sometimes it is called Newton's law, meaning the, the natural law discovered by Newton, but not created by Newton. So in the same way, the Padija Samupada was, or has been, uh, with the, with the being ever since they came into being. But this was hidden. This was not known by people. And so the Buddha uh, appeared and then they discovered uh, this law of dependence arising and then revealed it to the world. In fact, <coughs> Buddha knew, uh, Buddha knew the Patecha Samubhara, or Buddha was familiar with the law of dependence arising even before he became the Buddha. So as a Bodhisattva, he, he practiced Vipassana um, meditation on the factors contained in this the law of dependent arising. You, <coughs> I think you all know that on the full moon day of May, Buddha or rather Bodhisattva approached the body tree, sat under that body tree, and made a resolution that he would not not change the posture or he would not break the posture until he became the Buddha. And then he practiced meditation under that body tree the whole night. <coughs> so he practiced mindfulness of breathing meditation. And during the first part of the night, he attained the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth jhana, or in other words, he attained all four rupa vajra jhana. And then he continued his uh, meditation and he attained another four jhanas, four arupa vajra jhanas, or immaterial jhanas. So, he attained the first four mm, material jhanas and then four immaterial jhanas. And after that, he continued his practice and he gained what is called a supernormal knowledge. And it is called Abhinya in Pali. He should a, a particular supernormal knowledge 
by which he could remember all his past lives with minute details. Thanks to the Buddha's supernormal knowledge, uh, this kind of supernormal knowledge, we now have 547 lives uh, past lives of lives of the Buddha on record. And Bodhisattva continued his practice and during the second <coughs> um, middle part of the night he gained another supernormal knowledge. By that supernormal knowledge he he was able to see beings dying from one existence and being reborn in another existence according to their uh, karma, code of birth. And he saw them very clearly as it were on the screen. The Buddha's teaching of the law of karma came from that supernormal knowledge. And so Buddha's teaching was not, not based upon inference, are not based upon logical thinking, but his law of karma was based upon direct knowledge of beings uh, dying from one existence and being reborn in another. He continued his meditation, and during the last part of the night, <coughs> He practiced vipassana meditation, and when he practiced vipassana meditation, he took the the twelve factors in the law of <coughs> dependent arising as objects of vipassana meditation. Now there are twelve twelve factors in this uh, teaching of dependent arising. So you, you will see them later. So on each of these these factors, the Bodhisattva practiced vipassana meditation. Uh, when I say he practiced vipassana meditation, I mean he tries he tries to see the impermanent nature, suffering nature, and no soul nature of these factors, and he. He took one factor as an object and tried to see its impermanent suffering and said no so nature. And then he took the second factor and practiced vipassana meditation on it. And so he practiced in this way millions of times back and forth through these twelve factors of dependent arising. That is why I, I, I said. Um, Buddha was familiar with the, the, the dependent law of dependent arising even before he, he gained enlightenment as a Buddha. <coughs> um, before he practiced vipassana meditation on the factors of the dependent arising, he entered into the fourth Rupa Vajrajana, based on mindfulness of breathing. So after getting into it and then getting, getting out of it, or he entered into that he entered into that jhana and then he emerged from that jhana and practiced vipassana meditation on these factors of dependent arising back and forth, back and forth, millions of times. Is mm. during the stage of the knowledge of comprehension. There are different stages of vipassana knowledge, and that knowledge is actually the first of uh, those vipassana knowledge, the uh, knowledge of comprehension. So during that stage, uh, Bodhisattva practiced vipassana on all those twelve factors uh, millions of times.
page. He entered into the fourth jhana again. And then emerging from the fourth jhana, he went on to the next stage, the stage of seeing mental and physical phenomena arising and disappearing. So he went on this way until he reached the last stage of Vibhata. Now, after each stage, or between stages, he entered into the fourth jhana, and then got out of that fourth jhana and practiced Vipassana meditation. So his Vipassana was uh, not, not continuous. Vipassana for some time, and then they got into the fourth jhana, uh, which is Samatha, and then Vipassana again, and then Samatha, and so on. So why did he enter into the jhana? rather than practicing vipassana all along. Now it is said in our books that um, entering into the fourth jhana in between the, the vipassana stages is to sharpen his mind. You know, if, if, you, if you cut some say, hard uh, thing with a knife, the knife, uh, the, the blade of the knife gets what do you call it? Blunt, right? So you have to uh, sharpen the knife again to, to, for, for, for it to cut, uh, to cut well. So in the same way, in order to sharpen his wisdom, the Buddha, uh, or rather Bodhisattva, entered into the fourth jhana. And then, after emerging from it, he practiced the next stage, and then next stage, and so on. So you see, his practice of vipassana was on a deep scale. He practiced vipassana on the twelve factors as much as he liked. So his vipassana was called maha vipassana, or the grand vipassana. <coughs> and as a result of that vipassana, he attained enlightenment. At the, just before the dawn, or almost simultaneously with the dawn of the next day. So, on the full moon, on the night of the full moon day, he, he sat down on the, uh, at the body, body tree, and then he practiced meditation, and he, he attained enlightenment as a Buddha at dawn the next day. <coughs> He went through the four stages of enlightenment in rapid succession. So as a result of the grand vipassana, he reached the first stage of enlightenment. And then he practiced vipassana again and reached the second stage. And then vipassana and the third stage, and then vipassana and the fourth stage. So when he reached the fourth stage, he he became the Buddha. With the attainment of Buddhahood came to him what is called Sabbha Jnana, all-knowing wisdom. <coughs> so by that all-knowing all wisdom, the Buddha knew anything he wanted to know. I tell you this in detail because it will be difficult for you to get this information yourself. And also I want you to, um, to know that Buddha practiced Vipassana on all, all twelve factors and he became the Buddha. So not on just one of the factors, not on just one, one uh, mental or physical phenomenon. He, he practiced Vipassana on all these twelve factors. And all these twelve factors comprise mm, all mind and matter, actually. After his enlightenment, he 
sat under the Bodhi tree for seven days. It is said that he did not move, he did not stand up or something like that. So he spent the following seven days sitting under the Bodhi tree. And during the first night, he again contemplated on the law of dependent arising in due order and also in reverse order. In due order means the positive aspect of this law and in reverse order means the negative aspect of this law. Positive order means the arising of phenomena. Because because of this as a condition, there is some other thing arises. So that is called a due order. And the reverse order means not going backward, but the disappearance or the cessation of uh, these factors. Mm, like saying, with the total cessation of the one factor, the other factor also ceases and so on. So that is called uh, reverse order. On the seventh night, he contemplated on the Patitya Samuppada again. But this time, during the first part of the night, he just contemplated on the due order, in due order. And during the second or middle part of the night, he contemplated in the reverse order. And during the third or last watch of the uh, last part of the night, he contemplated on both uh, due order and reverse order. After that, during 45 years of his ministry, he taught the Patekya Samogbada, or Law of Dependent Arising, on many occasions. There is one whole chapter on the dependent origination in the Book of Kindred Sayings, and also the the teacher Samuppada was taught in Abhidhamma. <coughs> now, Buddha was very familiar with the law of dependent arising, and so he taught this doctrine in many different ways. Sometimes, he picked up the beginning, the first factor, and then went over to other factors, uh, so from the beginning to the end. Sometimes he picked up something in the middle, and then <coughs> went to the end. Sometimes he picked up the end, and then went backwards to the beginning. And sometimes he picked up in the middle, and then went backwards to the beginning. So he was so adept. <coughs> in this law of mm. dependent origination that he could teach any way uh, he likes or any way that would, uh, that would be beneficial to his audience. So when Buddha taught, he taught so that his listeners uh, could understand and attain enlightenment. So that is why there are many, many ways of his, uh, many methods of teaching uh, found in the Buddha's teaching. The particular Samo Buddha is not easy to understand. So it is a difficult doctrine. Buddha himself said that it was profound and uh, looks profound. Now, once the Venerable Ananda, his personal attendant, said to him, One day it's wonderful. But it is a that is so profound and it looks profound, but to me it's, it, it seems very vivid. So to me it, it, it's not so difficult to understand or something like that. So when Buddha heard this, he said, 
Don't say this Ananda. Don't say like this Ananda. Buddha said twice. Don't say like this Ananda. Don't say like this. But it just move on. It's profound as well as it looks profound. And because beings do not understand fully the, the law of uh, dependent origination, uh, they become confused and then they did wrong things and they, they go to full woeful state. And so <coughs> after saying that Buddha, uh, Buddha uh, preached the, the law of uh, dependent arising to Ananda, and at the end of the discourse Ananda was pleased with the Buddha. There is a thing <coughs> with regard to the teachers of Mubarak. And that thing was quoted very often by others as well as by preachers. And that thing is whoever sees the teachers of Mubarak sees the Dhamma. And whoever sees the Dhamma See the particulars of Mubarak. So that is the the exact translation of that saying. And we are tempted to to interpret this saying as if you know particulars of Mubarak, you know the Dhamma well, and if you know the Dhamma, you know the particulars of Mubarak. But the commentary explained is in a different way. Uh, since we are always dependent upon the ancient commentaries, we always like to, to follow the commentaries. Now, commentary says that in this saying, Paditya Samubhada means just the cause, and Dhamma means the result. So whoever knows the cause knows the result also, and whoever knows the result knows the cause also. So we should understand in that way and not in what we want it to, say, to, to, to convey or to mean. <coughs> we should also note that the teacher Samubhara deals with mental and physical phenomena in living beings only. So it does not deal with material phenomena outside living beings. So we cannot find answers to relationship between outside things like trees and mountains and so on. So it, it deals only with living beings. But there is another teaching called Patana, which deals with everything so with regard to living beings as well as to outside things. But this, mm -hmm. the doctrine of dependent origination deals only with uh, mental and physical phenomena of living beings. In order to understand Patija Samogada, <coughs> You need to have <coughs> you need to have a knowledge of the fundamentals of Abhidhamma. Without that knowledge, it is very difficult, or I should say, it is impossible to understand the, the law of dependent origination uh, to its full extent. <coughs> I hope some of you have a considerable knowledge of the fundamentals of Abhidhamma and so we'll be able to follow the explanation. you to 
to get familiar with the formula. The formula for Patija Samukata is very short, uh, as you see on the page. It doesn't even take half, a full half page. But the exposition of this very short formula runs into maybe a hundred pages or maybe more. And <coughs> since it is impossible to understand uh, this formula without the ancient ancient commentaries or ancient explanation, we will depend on the ancient commentaries for for the explanation of the Patitya Samampada. Fortunately, <coughs> there is a very detailed explanation of uh, this doctrine. We find the explanation given in two commentaries. One is the commentary to Abhidhamma Bhidaka and the other is uh, Visodhi Maga. But both these books were written by the same author. So the two explanations given in two books, I mean the explanations given in two books are uh, practically the same. <coughs> First I want you to be familiar with this formula in Pali, because we, because we will be using Pali these words again and again in our explanation. So the first, the head, heading is Paticca Samupada and then in, in parenthesis Anuloma. Anuloma means in due order. Actually, uh, Loma means hair, hair on one's body and Anu means along with. So along with the hair means the due order. And if opposite is Pati Loma, that means going against the, against the hair. So it is in due order. And I made a mistake because number 12 should be number 11. Yeah. <coughs> so the first, uh, so I want you to read the Pali. Avijja Pachaya Sankara. Sankara Pachaya Sankara Pachaya Vinyana 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 Pachaya Vinyana Pachaya Nama Rupam Nama Rupa Nama Rupa Pachaya Nama Rupa Pachaya Salayatanam Salayatanam Salayatana Pachaya Sala Pachaya Paso Paso Pasa Pachaya Pasa Pachaya Pachaya Upadana Pachaya Upadana Pachaya Bhavo 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 Pachaya Bhavo Pachaya Chati 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 Pachaya Chati Pachaya Chara Marana Chara Marana Soka Soka Paridewa Paridewa Dukha Dukha Domana Supayasa Domana Supayasa Sambhavanti Sambhavanti so, when, when you read the last sentence, M should be uh, connected with the E after it. So you say Eva Metasa Eva Metasa Kevalasa Kevalasa Dukkha Khandhasa Dukkha Khandhasa Samudayo 
สัตว์ทุกโลกโอติโอติประเทศที่ไฟไฟมาสปอนเซอร์ฟอร์ดิจิทัลแอนด์ออริจินเนชั่นออริจินแอนด์อะไรสิ่งดิดิสมอลล์ไลน์สับบ์สันเลดัสอินดิเคเดอ And those vowels are long vowels. In Pali, there are short vowels and long vowels. So long vowels are indicated by a, a line above it. So let's see. In, in number one, you see uh, an E after J. So that E has a line above it. So that means it is long. So you you, you say a wee j, not a wee j. So A is short and A is long. E is short and E long. U is short and U long. So a w i j a p a c h a y a now sankara. The <coughs> and there is a dot above the end. So it's okay. <laughs> so sankara. Sankara. Right. And then Sankara p a c c h a y a Sankara p a c c h a y a Vinyanam. Vinyanam. Now, if you are familiar with Spanish, then you know you know those letters. <coughs> so they are pronounced like in Spanish n y a So it, 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 here there is a double n y a So Vinyanam. Now there is another dot below the end. So one dot above the end, and another dot below the end. So uh, that means that it, it is articulated with some some um, instruments in the mouth. Uh, they, they are called c e r e b r a l s If you don't understand, it, it's okay. But when we write Pali, we have to. We have to put those dots above or to, so that we can be correct uh, spelling. So once again, Sankara p a c h a y a Vinyanam, M with the dot above. Okay. So, act, <coughs> although uh, it is not so important, uh, M. By itself, and M with the dot, these two are different, although they have the same meaning. So number three, let us go. Vinyana p a c h a y a Vinyana p a c h a y a Nama Rupam. Nama Rupam. So in Nama Rupam, the first A is long, and the second is short. So Nama, and then Rupam, then the U. With, with, with the stroke after uh, above it, so it is long. So r u b a m not r u b a m it is r u b a m Yeah. Nama r u b a p a c h a y a Nama r u b a p a c h a y a Salayatana. Salayatana. But it's not the n e t l e l Just forget about it. <laughs> สาลาเยตนาสาวฝ่ายสาลาเยตนาปัจเจยาสาลาเยตนาปัจเจยาทัศโสทัศโสทัศปัจเจยาทัศปัจเจยาเวดนาเวดนา now this V we 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 pronounce just like uh, like the W but if you if you follow the correct phonetic laws of Pali Then you pronounce this as as we pronounce the English V. But in in Burma as well as in Ceylon and maybe in Thailand also, we it is pronounced uh, just I like W W. So we always say w e d a n a w e d a n a So whether you say w e d a n a or w e d a n a it's all right. So p a s a p a c h a y a w e d a n a วิญญาปัจเจยาตัณหาวิญญาปัจเจยาตัณหาตัณหาปัจเจยาอุปาดานะตัณหาปัจเจยาอุปาดานะ
อุปาดานะปัจจยาภาวะอุปาดานะปัจจยาภาวะนะวันนี้ว่าเรื่อง H following a consonant it means that consonant is aspirated not not B A would be B but B H A would be B it's a little different but if you cannot Uh, pronounce it correctly. It's okay. <laughs> I, I just want to know that it is pronounced this way. So, namo tassa bhagavato, not just bhagavato, actually, but uh, for many people it's difficult because it's it's not in in their language. อุปาดานะปัจจยาบาวะอุปาดานะปัจจยาบาวะบาวะปัจจยาญาติบาวะปัจจยาญาติญาติปัจจยาญาติปัจจยาญาติมรณะมรณะมรณะโชคะโชคะดิดิโอดิโอ is you can pronounce just o or o But we 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 pronounce O, but O and O not 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 much different. So Soka, Soka, Paridewa, Paridewa. E is always pronounced A. Dewa, not Dewa. So Paridewa, Paridewa. Like like A Y and D A Y. Paridewa, Paridewa. Dukha, Dukha. ดมนัสุปายาสะดมนัสุปายาสะสัมภวันติสัมภวันติเอวะเมตัสสะเอวะเมตัสสะ If there were a dot above M, we should say เอวะเมตัสสะ But since there is no dot above the M. We we uh, combine the M with the following A, and so we say A wa me tasa, K wa lasa, Dukha kandasa, Dukha kandasa, Samudayo, Samudayo, Hoti, Hoti. So in Pali, B H is one letter. K H also one letter. They, they, they are not double consonant. One letter, aspirated letter. Okay. <coughs> And also the the vowel A, like in Awija, is always pronounced A, And not not like in in the American English A, right? Uh, you say P A T P A T, right? But in in Pali you you never say Uh, if you, if, even if you find PAT, you never say pet, but pet, like like U S N B U T, but. So patija samupa da, awija patija. So, <coughs> okay. Seven sentences, but twelve factors because jaramarana is one factor. Now the word patija. You 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 see, p a t i a repeated in every every sentence. So you need to know the meaning of the word p a t i a It is. Oh, I'm I'm talking too long. I forgot about it. Translate. <laughs> so the meaning of the word p a t i a There are two meanings, and. Sometimes it means one, and sometimes uh, another. So p a c h a y a means a cause, or a condition. Now, cause and condition are different here. By cause, we may mean something that produces some other thing. Something is the cause of another. Sometimes we just mean a condition. That means, uh, for example. Seeing, 
seeing arises because there is something to be seen. So something to be seen is a condition for the arising of seeing. But it does not, pro- the, 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 something to be seen does not produce the seeing. But seeing arises with the help of, or depending upon something to be seen. So that, that we call a condition. Sometimes uh, it, it may really produce. So uh, pachaya has two meanings. Uh, producer or cause or condition. So condition means help. It helps in, in arising of an existence of some other thing. So we have to understand that the word pali, what pachaya in two meanings. In two ways. <coughs> so the first sentence, avijja pachaya sankhara. Now, avijja pachaya means because of avijja as condition. Sankhara. Sankharas arise. Or because there is avijja as pachaya, as a condition. There arise sankara. We have met um, many translation, English translations of the dependent origination. I think um, what I'm saying now is the closest uh, to the original. So you may translate it as dependent upon avijja, uh, sankaras arise. Are conditioned by avijja. Sankharas arise. You may give a translation that way too. But the literal translation should be because there is avijja as a pachaya, as a condition, sankharas arise. Because there are sankhara as condition, vijnana arise. Arises. Vijnana means consciousness. You can see the in. English translations below. So because of the consciousness as a condition, nama and rupa. Nama means mind and rupa matter. Mind and matter arise. Because of nama and rupa as condition, salayatana, six sense bases arise and so on. So in this way as you should understand. Because because there is avijja or ignorance. Because there is ignorance as condition, there are sankharas. Because there are sankharas as condition, there is consciousness and so on. <coughs> now, before going right into this formula, uh, let us follow the train of thought that occurred to bodhisattvas. Now, bodhisattvas are extraordinary people. They are not like ordinary people. So they have more wisdom and more compassion than ordinary people. So bodhisattvas (coughs) sometimes saw the beings suffering. They saw that there is aging, there is old age, there is disease, there is suffering, that there is death, and all this is suffering. And so they wanted to find a way out of this suffering. So in order to find that way, they, they contemplated on what causes aging and death. And it occurred to their mind that the cause of aging and death is birth. Because we are born we were born as <coughs> human beings, we have to suffer aging. From the moment we are born until the moment we die. So we are always uh, uh, tormented by aging every second of our life. And then at the end, we will die. All this occur because we were born as a human being. 
So the birth as a human being is the cause of aging and death. So this way, mm. the Bodhisattva has contemplated on this mm. dependent origination. So they, 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 they went backward. So they take what is now evident as a starting point. So we, we know that we are aging, we know that we will die one day, and we, we don't want to, to, to get old, we don't want to die, but we will, there is no way out. So if we want to get rid of this, we, we, we must understand what causes this. So we, must, we, we should find a cause, and the Bodhisattva find the, found the cause as the birth. So the birth in one, one uh, life is the cause of old, um, aging and death in that life. What causes death? I mean, what causes birth? What is the cause of birth in, in an existence? It's a very tough question, right? What we know now is just what Buddha taught. So we wish we had the supernormal knowledge that the Buddha had. But since we don't have that knowledge, then we have to follow the, the thinking of the Buddha's teachings. Now, let us consider this way. Is this our first birth, our first existence, or was there some kind of existence before this life? We don't know. But we can, uh, we can infer from some things. Now, be, beings are born different. Even, even the, the offsprings born of the same parents are different. See? Mm -hmm. Some are kind and others are not. Even, even uh, brothers and sisters are not, not, not same in their temperament, in their ability, in their intelligence and so, uh, also in their appearance. So why is there this difference? If it is created by some, someone or something, then they should be the same. And why did the, the Creator uh, make some, some boy uh, intelligent and the other uh, dull or something like that? So if we consider this, we can infer that there must be something before this life that causes uh, uh, to be born as an intelligent boy or as a dull boy, um, as a kind boy or as a cruel boy and so on. So there must be something before this because we cannot attribute the difference to, to heredity or to environment because uh, the, the children brought up uh, in the same environment, grew up differently. So there must be a cause for this difference. And if we cannot find this, the, this cause in this life, it follows that it must be in some previous time or previous life. So something that we did in the previous life has caused us to be born here as an intelligent boy, or as a tall boy, as a rich man, or as a poor man, and so on. So in, if we think that way, we can at, at least, we, we don't know it intuitively, but we can at least infer that there must be something before this life, and there must be something in that life uh, which we did there, and which, uh, which uh, made us uh, born here as different human beings. So that, that thing which causes us to be reborn here is uh, what is called karma. So karma is in this, uh, in this formula called by two names, Bawa. So we infer and Bodhisattvas really saw that 
the cause of condition of birth is something we did in the past, something, uh, some karma uh, which is good or bad. So that, that karma we did in the past can uh, result at birth in this life. So we infer and body has a soul from, from uh, so that the cause or condition of uh, birth in this life is to reason. There is the good or bad karma we did in the past. Then what is the cause or condition of karma? Why do we do good karma or bad karma? We have strong desire, which is called clinging, strong desire to be reborn in a better existence, strong desire to be reborn as a celestial being. And so that strong desire makes us do good or bad karma. Now, uh, suppose we hear someone talk about pleasures in the celestial world, and then we want to be reborn in the celestial world. We, so we have a strong desire to be reborn there. So if we want to be reborn in the celestial world, then we must do something that will uh, enable us to be reborn there. And if we, if we have uh, good teachers, then they will tell us, oh, you do some meditative do like uh, giving, keeping precepts or such a meditation. So if you do this meditative seat, you will, so you will be reborn there. And so we do meditative seat. And as a result of uh, meritorious seat, we will be reborn there. Sometimes we may approach a fourth teacher, and they may, they may uh, say to us, if you want you to be reborn there, sacrifice an animal. Something like that. Sacrifice a goat, or sacrifice a pig, or something like that. So in order to be reborn there, and we have uh, faith in that teacher, we kill an animal, sacrificing it, so that we, uh, with the hope that we will be reborn there. But sacrificing an animal or killing an animal is not a good karma, it is a bad karma. So as a result of that karma, we will be reborn, but not in the celestial world we will be hoped for, but down in a woeful state. So, the strong desire to be reborn in a celestial world makes us do sometimes bad meritorious deeds and sometimes uh, killing or something, some, some unwholesome act. So that strong desire is a condition for the karma to arise. Okay. Time is up for today, so we'll continue to follow the thoughts of Bodhisattva tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> Yesterday... Uh, 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 uh,